Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. Let me ask you a question. What is a musician? Are you one? Am I? Are drummers musicians if they don't work with harmony or melody? How about composers who write music but don't necessarily perform it, or music theorists who study it at a deep level but may not actually make music at all? I'd say they all count, but fundamentally this is a philosophical question based on cultural values, and people from different cultures may have very different answers to the question who counts as a musician. Which is fine, at least for most of us, but there's one group of people for whom this sort of wishy-washy answer just isn't good enough music psychologists. You see, a lot of music psychology is about exploring the cognitive differences between musicians and non-musicians, and in order to do that, we need to know who belongs in which group. This means we have to operationalize the concept of musicianship, which is a fancy way of saying we need to turn it into numbers so we can compare it to other numbers and hopefully find something meaningful. The first attempt to do this was published in 1919 by a man named Carl Emil Seashore, who developed the Seashore measures of musical talent, and looking at them tells us a lot about how psychologists of that era thought about music. You see, at the time, talent was viewed as mostly static. When you were born, you were hardwired to be good at certain things and bad at others, and that didn't really change over the course of your life. You could improve with practice, of course, but you were fundamentally limited by your natural abilities. You were either a musician or you weren't, and Seashore's tests were a way of determining whether it was worth your time to try and develop those skills in the first place. So how did it work? Well, at its heart was a battery of five multiple-choice tests, each focused on a different bit of musical perception. The first test focused on pitch. You'd hear two notes, and you'd be asked whether the the second note was higher or lower than the first. Here, give it a shot. Did you guess that it was higher? Well, congratulations, you're officially a musician. Okay, this section actually had like 50 questions and the notes got a whole lot closer, but still, you're probably a musician anyway. Other parts worked similarly, including a test for time sensitivity where three clicks were played and you had to determine if the second gap was longer or shorter than the first, and a test for volume which asked which of the two pitches played was louder. Then we come to a test for consonants. This is interesting because, in a sense, consonants is subjective. It's a measure of how nice groups of notes sound together, and that's largely a question of taste. Is this more consonant than this? Well, it depends which sound you like more, and what exactly counts as consonants and dissonance has changed drastically over the years. But again, if we're gonna do science to these results, they need to be consistent, so we instead turn to the more mathematical version of consonants, how closely the sounds approximate simple integer ratios. We've talked about this before, so I won't go into too much detail, but basically by comparing the frequencies of the two notes and doing some fancy math, we can generate something that sort of resembles an objective value for how consonant a given interval is, and Seashore reasoned that, regardless of personal preference, a good musician should be able to identify these relationships. The final test was for melodic memory, and it worked a bit differently. Each example was a short melody between two and six notes long. He'd play the melody twice, but the second time through one note would be changed, and you'd have to tell him which one it was. Here, try it out. Did you get it? It was the fourth one. This test combines your ability to perceive different intervals with your ability to remember melodic ideas over time, making it probably the most directly applicable of the tests. This version of Seashore's measures was used for about 20 years, but in 1939, he and his collaborators released a revised version based on what they learned in that time. This included some changes to how they structured the questions, but most importantly, it introduced two new sections. The first was a rhythm test, similar to the melodic memory one, where you heard two rhythmic patterns and had to determine if they were the same or different. The other new test focused on timbre, which is sort of like a tone color. Basically, timbre is the difference between a guitar and a piano playing the same note. This test replaced the consonants test, which had fallen out of favor, although I haven't found any clear indication as to why. But the most important feature of Seashore's measures wasn't the specific questions it asked, it was the mountains of data that came with it. While developing the system, Seashore tested over 5,000 students to get a sense of how good an average child of any given age should be, so when a new kid took the test, he could determine how good they were relative to their peers. In effect, he could identify future prodigies even if they hadn't yet picked up an instrument. At least, that was the idea. And it seems to have worked, at least sometimes. Newspaper articles from the time tell the story of a young boy from Iowa who wanted to play the violin, but his father wanted him to study business, so they went to Seashore to determine his fate. Fortunately, he did well on the tests, and went on to become a successful violinist, apparently described as the Iowa Chrysler, after famed violinist Fritz Chrysler. But a lot has changed in the centuries since Seashore first published his methods, and modern critics point to a fairly significant detail that this story glosses over. The boy really wanted to be a violinist, 
violinist enough to push his father into consulting an expert in the hopes of being allowed to pursue that dream. That sort of drive and passion is also a huge part of becoming a great musician, but Seashore's tests had no room for it because it's really hard to quantify. In the years since Seashore's work, many other tests have sprung up to address this and other problems, but one that seems to capture the modern approach pretty well is the Goldsmith's Musical Sophistication Index, or Gold MSI for short. How does it work? Well, it also includes a melodic memory test, where they play a melody in two different keys and then ask you whether or not the melodic structure was the same both times. Plus, there's a beat perception test, where they play a musical sample and overlay the sound of a metronome that's either on or slightly off the beats to see how well you can lock into a song's pulse. Then there's a beat production test, which is the same thing except the participant provides the metronome, tapping along to the recording while a computer judges how close they are. Most of the raw perception tests from Seashore are gone, though, and in their place we have a couple new features. The first is a genre sorting test, based on some research we've talked about before, where test subjects were able to identify the names and styles of songs from incredibly short samples. This test uses 16 clips, each 400 milliseconds long, and asks participants to sort them by similarity into four groups of four clips each. The songs were chosen to be emblematic of certain genres, and listeners who were able to correctly associate different songs of the same genre were considered more musically sophisticated. The last feature, though, is probably the most radical, at least from a perspective like Seashore's self-evaluation. The test includes a questionnaire asking lots of questions about how you engage with music, how good you think you are at it, and how committed you are to making it. If you want to try it out yourself, my friend David Baker sent me a copy of the questionnaire. There's a link in the description. Dave's a doctoral candidate studying computational musicology at Louisiana State University, and he also helped me find sources, proofread the script for accuracy, and inspired this whole video with a talk he did, so huge thanks to him for being so awesome. And you can find him on Twitter at David John Baker if you want more smart music people in your feed. So where does this leave us? Who, in the end, counts as a musician? It's a tough question because the right answer depends on why you're asking in the first place. For people like Dave, there may never be a perfect answer, and as the questions they ask get harder, there may always be a need for newer, better tests. But for you and I, we can probably just call ourselves musicians. No one's gonna double check. Anyway, thanks for watching and thanks to our Patreon patrons for supporting us and making these videos possible. If you want to help out and get some sweet perks like sneak peeks of upcoming episodes, there's a link to our Patreon on screen now. You can also join our mailing list to find out about new episodes, like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, keep on rocking.